Good morning. Welcome to yet another edition of Face to Face. It is Kong Yu with you for the edition dated June 4th, 2020. Once again, zooming in on the topic and the uh, crucial uh, topic, in fact, of e-commerce uh, in lieu of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the way forward, uh, as well as the future. Yeah. Uh, introducing over the phone lines today, my special guest today, for the segment, Dr. Sri Vijay S. Warren, who is the executive chairman of the Chi Group. Uh, and there, just a little bit of an introduction on Dato Sri, uh, who is a prominent Malaysian entrepreneur and also businessman, uh, being the current executive chairman of uh, the QI Group of Companies, one of Asia's leading business conglomerate with interest in direct selling, retail, financial services, hospitality, education, and also technology. Dr. Sri Vijay is also the chairman of the University Council of Quest International University in Pira, also a member of the advisory board of the Global Business Council and Corporate Malaysia Roundtable. Yeah? Without any further ado, I'd like to welcome over the phone lines uh, Dr. Sri Vijay. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, how are you, sir? I am very well, thank you. Okay, well, it's good to have you here, and thank you so much. I know you're a busy, busy man, uh, and for taking time out to speak to us today, Dr. Sri. No worries. Okay, but before that, maybe a personal introduction from your side. I think our listeners uh, would love to uh, get to know you better. Dr. Sri, can you share with us your entrepreneurial journey? It's a long journey, I'm pretty sure, but maybe some key highlights from that. Uh, more importantly, your foray into e-commerce business, and this was some 20-odd years ago, Dr. Sri, right? That's correct. Mm. About 22 years ago, in 1998, um, I um, had got back to this region. I had been studying and working abroad for about 13 years, so... Um, and coming back to Malaysia um, was an um, interesting experience, uh, kind of eye-opening in a way. Uh -huh. But what I brought with me was the fact that um, I envisage, as a lot of people did at the time, that the world would be turning towards the Internet. Uh, you must remember this is 1998, so pretty much uh, uh, the Internet was still a newfangled device. Uh -huh. And uh, so like Amazon and Alibaba, around that same period, we started. Uh, what I saw was, um, in my mind, a merging of three basic uh, different uh, industries. One being e-commerce, which was in its fledgling state. And then we had um, direct sales and network marketing. So combining all three is how we began. In, uh, and we began out of Hong Kong in 1998. It's been a as you say, a 22-year um, journey. Um, the reason that I felt that network marketing and direct sales needed e-commerce to thrive in this region was simply because of the... The World Bank has been repeating for quite a while that around 2025, we would be adding another 750 million people to the workforce. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this corner of the world, it's like in uh, most third world countries, uh, we don't have the capacity to absorb that kind of labor. And uh, in fact, there's, there's no country in the world that will be able to absorb it. Uh, which means that it leads to the concept of the gig economy, meaning that people would be able to work essentially as and when they need to uh, around the clock from wherever they need to. So ideally, network marketing fits that role. And I see that as something that was fitting the vacuum of the time, if you know what I mean. Uh -huh. So uh, that is part of the journey. And then, you know, we began out of Hong Kong and we have stretched over uh, some 30 odd nations right now and uh, built a network of um, about uh, just over a million active uh, customers and perhaps a database of close to 18, 19 million people across the world. So we basically believe in being able to step online, um, buy what you need, and have it delivered to your doorstep. That's the essential principle. And um, that has become possible over the last two years, uh, sorry, the last two decades. And uh, primarily because of globalization, the concept of a global village coming into force. Um, this has reversed itself somewhat in the last year or two and with the advent of Trump. <laughs> but nevertheless, I see globalization as a necessary 
development, a necessary part of human evolution. Mm-hmm. So, um, in a sense, yeah. uh, today, the millennials and centennials who are um, the driving force of any market uh, across the world are more used to being online than you know any other generation before. Mm-hmm. And that's actually, it's interesting that you're saying, you know, a couple of things. One is, you know, uh, within the industry of network marketing itself, uh, you saw the importance actually of being online. Uh, and you also uh, mentioned the uh, foresight actually in terms of having products ordered and then delivered straight. Uh, and also you brought up also the uh, uh, gig economy, which is something that a lot of people have been talking about. Um, yeah. may, only recently, I mean, people have been in the gig economy for some time now, probably the last two decades, just like in your business. But yeah. the awareness of uh, the importance of actually doing that, especially moving into future. Uh, and in that sense, an industry like network marketing has always gotten it right. Yes, mm-hmm. perhaps. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I have spoken about this at the World Economic Forum in, in Davos, uh, which I've attended a few times. And... Um, and I spoke specifically about the gig economy and the role that network marketing plays. Uh, very clearly, network marketing has stepped into the gap uh, that has been left behind by the advent of the Industrial Revolution, where with the nine to five jobs began. Mm-hmm. And the fact that in today's world and economy, with AI playing such an important role, jobs are shrinking. You know, a uh, classic case in point is South Korea. South Korea has actually, you know, quadrupled this economy um, over the years, but its job, its demand for uh, job creation has dropped dramatically. So it's a fast advancing country with all everything going for it, but still not enough jobs to meet uh, demand. So there we have a, a classic situation of what the rest of the world, particularly us, in Malaysia and in Southeast Asia are going to face. If we do not have the gig economy to depend upon, then we are in serious trouble. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the, the, the Arab Spring, for example, is just a reaction to that. You know, youth coming into the workforce with no right to go. Mm-hmm. So um, that's where I see the role of uh, network marketing plays because and plus the fact that you have added on the e-commerce component, so very much you have an Amazon online that you can carry to your customers wherever they are and have products delivered to their doorstep. Mm-hmm. And in this particular time of COVID, it fits the bill very well. Mm-hmm. Just a little bit more before we move on to you know, addressing what the uh, pandemic has been teaching us, will be teaching as well uh, in the near-term future. Dr. Sri, it's interesting that uh, coming from a business such as network marketing and then also having that foresight to put an emphasis uh, correctly so on uh, the digital side of things, e-commerce, uh, going online, how do you actually reconcile uh, both aspects? One is actually the somewhat uh, less personal nature of things which are online as well as the importance of actually being able to connect uh, human to human, especially in an industry like network marketing, that industry. Well, uh, you've actually hit right on the nail in regards to uh, what we have tried to build into our um, particular approach to the industry. Mm. It's a compromise in a sense. Mm. So we have added on the technological features in the product and the services, but you know the front end of the business still requires. Uh, a person-to-person connect. Mm. Now, um, the person-to-person connect has evolved somewhat because it's not what it was, uh, you know, obviously pre-COVID, where, you know, you could meet people in in a Starbucks or, you know, a coffee shop, a coffee shop, and Mm -hmm. have a chat, you Mm -hmm. know, and and a handshake, you know, it receives everything happening. Right. But today, it's all on Zoom and, you know, Microsoft Teams and whatever have you know you have online and they're connecting they're actually doing it on phone and zoom and internet so that evolution has just happened within the very last uh, two months mm-hmm. and we have been amazed watching it grow uh, in the in the manner and it has because it has uh, actually superseded all our expectations mm-hmm. uh, and it's amazing to see what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. 
it, it's very interesting indeed. I mean, I use the word very loosely and lightly, right? But in a lot of sense, I think prior uh, to 2020, yeah, uh, the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic and everything, I think to some extent, I think we were all largely still holding on to stubbornly to certain good old ways of how, for example, business is transacted and everything, even though we've had the means, I think, to actually say, uh, do uh, meetings online, you know, video calls and all that, uh, even though, of course, many apps and providers have jumped on board uh, in a major way. But even prior to that, we had that access already. But I think many of us weren't using it, weren't tapping into uh, meeting online and video calls and all that. Uh, for the sake of just, you know, holding on to the good old, same old that we've done uh, for the past uh, decades, in fact, yeah? Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. The thing is, um, people need to recognize that at the end of it all, it doesn't matter whether you are in a kopitiam or whether you're sitting in, in, in a Starbucks, you're still talking to a person. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, you need to get over the hang-up of the fact that you're looking at the screen and recognize the fact that communication at the end is person-to-person. Mm-hmm. And um, nothing much has changed. I mean, um, the, the difference uh, could be the, the vibes and the environment, but the advantage would be that you're sitting at home in your sarong and doing business, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, however, you know, uh, it, has, it has taken us by surprise and I was talking to the chairman of the bank the other day and I think you'd find this interesting Um, apparently you know uh, ATMs were the the fundamental uh, core of their business how business transactions evolved from the bank teller to the ATM so the ATMs became the core of their business Mm -hmm. over the last couple of decades but in the last two months it switched from and they had only 5% of internet banking Right. In the last two months, it reversed. ATMs dropped to 5%, and internet banking shot up to 75%. So wow. uh, that is a clear indication of what's happening to the world out there. Everyone is doing it. I mean, Zoom birthday parties are, are very typical right now. I had to <laughs> attend like four in the last week. You know? <laughs> so, um, but, but that's the world we need to step into. The millennials and centennials are living there already. Mm-hmm. They don't find that strange. Mm-hmm. That's the generational divide. Mm-hmm. You know, you, if you're talking to your kids, and and I, I can already predict in a sense what your grandkids will be doing, but for them, this is the this is the norm anyway. Mm-hmm. It may be the new norm for us, but for them, it's exactly what they do. So they're they're taking to it like a fish to water. Right. Right. So we, we just need to evolve. I mean, businesses have to evolve. And uh, the only way they can do so is by recognizing that moving ahead, the new norm is always going to be including this particular aspect, mm-hmm. uh, which is going to be online. Mm-hmm. In, in what other ways do you foresee uh, the recent situation, circumstances of 2020, COVID-19 pandemic, and other issues, yeah? Transforming e-commerce. Well, I think it will forever change retailing. Mm-hmm. That is for sure. Um, um, you know, it, it's going to be. We're going to walk into a, a, an entirely new environment when we step out of this eventually, and um, and I do believe we will step out of it. the The issue would be how many of us have the staying power to survive. Now, the SMEs are the ones that are going to take the biggest hit. Uh, in, inevitably, because uh, they're not able to sustain over this length of time, um, which means that uh, you know, apart from you know, um, many companies having closed up, your favorite kopitiam will probably be closed as you step out into the new world and start you know, getting back to what you think you were doing before. Mm-hmm. There will be um, a whole new brand makeover of the world and um, uh, it is something that we're going to have to start working and recognizing that there, there's also going to be new jobs there are going to be new applications of technology i mean uh, security is going to be one of the biggest challenges out there you know 
online security and protecting identities, protecting accounts from whatever, yep. paperwork and so on. All of these challenges will, will crop up. But e-commerce sales has come to stay in a major way. Uh, the comfort of having things delivered into your doorstep right now, more so than ever before, has become a reality. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you're not, you, you know, I wouldn't have dreamt of buying vegetables online, seriously. <laughs> you know, I come from a generation where you got to touch and feel and, and smell right. the food. Right, you got to you got to select your own, you know, veg- vegetables and fruits, right? <laughs> so. yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you know, it's not something that I can relate to. I mean, for instance, you know, uh, you know, buying a durian to me, it's not possible. You mm. know, to buy online. <laughs> but um, you know, it's it's something you want to shake and hold and smell and and all of that. You actually want it open right in front of you, actually. <laughs> but. You're right. But having said that, having said that, uh, the kids of today, the millennials, the centennials, I recognize that they are very focused on the reviews, mm. the online comments and the reviews that mm-hmm. are constantly, you know, running on the site. For instance, the, um, you know, let's take Korean drama. I mean, I'm now very recently, because of COVID, got interested in watching Korean dramas and <laughs> doing yeah. And I noticed there's running comments on commentary on the on the on the side. On the side, know? yeah. Mm. Uh, it's just continuously going on, and um, and uh, when I when I turn, you know, uh, to the children to ask them what the heck, why is this bothering? It's bothering me from watching the the, the show. To them, that commentary tells them whether this show is worth watching or not. They they decide by listening, uh, you know, by going through all of that, uh, whether they should continue watching the series or they get all kinds of information on it. Uh, should they switch over to another one, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Durian for them, they rather trust the commentaries mm-hmm. than go out and actually hold it and, you know, smell it. Mm-hmm. So they depend on all kinds of reviews and commentaries and whatnot uh, to make their judgment call. And that is going to be marketing of the future. I mean, be it fashion apparel or, you know, vegetables. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and, and another new development is that even people in the wet markets, you know, in the wet markets are going around with iPhones, taking pictures of their vegetables mm-hmm. and sending it to their regular customers who are at home and then telling them this just came in this morning and taking extra pictures or videos, if you like, you know, walking through the store. And then, you know, the manche or the grandma sits home and looks at it and says, okay, I want that, I want this, I want that. They haggle over the price and then it's delivered to the doorstep. Mm. Now that's something that would have never been possible without this current situation. Yeah. Yeah, interesting thoughts. That is three. I'm going to put you on the hold. We're going to take a very short break here, so to get a you know uh, catch up on this, your breath, and uh, we can have a short little break. Uh, but we'll be back soon in uh, under 15 seconds. And uh, yep, okay, back in a bit right here on Face to Face. Welcome back to Face to Face. It's Kong Yu with you live on the show as always. This hour talking to Dr. Sri VJ Eswaran and uh, talking about e-commerce. Yeah, uh, from uh, a businessman who has been in the industry for over 20 plus years, uh, one of the pioneers to recognize the importance of uh, having a good website, having key technical details on products uh, prominently and clearly displayed, and also uh, merging that with the personal touch of uh, human interaction when it comes to sales, and uh, bringing that into the feel of the currents. Fast forward some 20 over years, and here we're in discussion on how businesses have to thrive and survive in uh, different ways, yeah, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Sometimes I don't want to use the word post-pandemic, uh, Dr. Sri, because we're not quite sure what the uh, current <laughs> and near-term future situation is like, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, from the consumer side of things, yeah, a consumer behavioral change, as you, you, you listed one uh, ane- anecdotally, right, right before the break, people shopping for produce, especially uh, in certain age groups, consumers would never have thought of trusting things like reviews or maybe what they see over, uh, back then it was just purely online and on the internet. Nowadays it's across social media platforms. Uh, and being able to trust the judgment of 
in a way, the collective, when it comes to choosing things like, um, uh, even I would have to extend that analogy to also uh, things that we wear, right? Uh, clothing, yes. fashion and all that. Uh, yes. But that definitely has changed and, and uh, there's no looking back, right, Dr. Sri? No, no. Mm -hmm. It has changed dramatically, but uh, the human component is very important. In the analogy I was referring to, mm -hmm. The vegetable seller is walking through, uh, you know, unlike um, a stationary photograph in a, in a supermarket web website. Right. You're actually, you know, having someone walk through, uh, show you what they have in their produce, talk about that. Mm -hmm. And the selling point would be exactly that, that you get to almost see it in real time. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, you are not... Uh, you know, uh, looking at a photograph that was taken maybe generically a week ago or even uh, a day before, you're looking at actually what you're going to buy. Right. And that makes a big difference. And having that human touch on the other end, you know, maybe if we're talking of fashion apparel or uh, clothing or uh, jewelry, then having someone on the other end holding it up and talking to you, mm. you know, personally makes that difference. Which mm. is which is what has always made a difference to us in network marketing because mm -hmm. that you need that uh, human to human connect to complete uh, the actual uh, transaction uh, you know satisfactory That's now right. the thing is that um, people are going to make drastic and dramatic changes as they come out of this there's, there's no question about that mm -hmm. and there's going to be a period we're going to be living in flux but we have done this before. We have been through this before. Uh, in fact, periodically, almost every hundred years, you know, uh, it was the Spanish flu in 1918, and mm -hmm. then a uh, hundred years before that was cholera or something, it's the Black Plague. So almost every hundred years, mankind has been hit by a pandemic. And we had to go through it, and resulting in also structural changes, technological changes. Uh, you know, horses were the standard way people traveled across the world, mm -hmm. you know, by bullock cart, carriage, whatever. Animals were the main form of transportation right up to 19, uh, 1918 or so. World War One was fought on horseback. Mm -hmm. But within a decade, right after, you had the introduction of rail, you, the motor vehicles, and flight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the right brothers had their first planes. And a dramatic change of, you know, in a decade, people change from horseback to sitting in motor cars and, and trains. And um, uh, the fact of the matter is jobs were wiped out in an instant. Mm -hmm. in, you know, people were making saddles and horseshoes and working with horses. Now I had to become mechanics, you know, and deal with production of cars. Factories began, Henry Ford began. So... And, and that results in a whole new leap forward. Mm -hmm. We are back there right now. Mm. And uh, we, being the transitional generation, you know, having grown up in a different time and, and a different place, and we'll have to adjust to the new norms coming up. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, but we have tried and we have gone through this a few times before. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, even the advent of television changed our lives here yeah, in, you know, in Malaysia. I remember my granddad looking at it and calling it the devil's box. <laughs> right. You know, because he says it, it stops the children from going out to play. He can he could not understand for uh, any particular reason. He could not understand why children would be stuck in front of a box <laughs> for three hours, you know. He was right to some extent. <laughs> Yes, yes, and, and he was. Uh, uh, but but then again, mm. uh, today, uh, we have also gone back to the roots. I mean, the planet is healing. Mm -hmm. The rivers are clearing up. The oceans are clearing. I mean, literally, the nature is taking a breath because of what's going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I, and, and I think one key part of it, uh, Dr. Sri, because you were also talking about how uh, the human touch is still crucial in terms of uh, being able to... Uh, evaluate yeah, a current situation or current product or produce like we're talking about and I think the key is actually in authenticity and, and a return to uh, an extent of that uh, in terms of you know stripping away filters and photographs which may have been you know brushed up and taken like you were saying a few months ago of a particular product now people want uh, the direct connection to what's real and what's 
truer, if I can use that yes. term. Yeah? Yes, they, they need that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why the gig economy has a very important role to play because we need people on both ends. Mm -hmm. uh, allowing the internet to be what it always has been, which has been a, mo a, a modality by which we connect to each other. Mm -hmm. so, and that is the fundamental role. Uh, um, I don't see that changing very much. That is, in fact, uh, going to be creating you know, um, new jobs and new requirements, mm -hmm. a new understanding of what is uh, Businesses have to cope with that. Right. So... But singing, working at home is something that is something we are also having to get used to because mm -hmm. managers have to come up with new KPIs and new deadlines and deliverables and uh, we're not going to be looking at the clock as much mm -hmm. as opposed to looking at productivity mm -hmm. and, for, in, and results. Absolutely. For, for so many decades, I think we were stuck in that mode where it was yes. about the clock. It was about what time you clock in and, and a lot of... Uh, uh, work environments, uh, what time you leave as well, not so much about the deliverables and the productivity per se. Sad, but true. And uh, even schools and universities are going to dramatically change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we, we are basically looking at universities that were uh, designed in the 19th century and uh, staffed by lecturers from the 20th century trying to create students for the 21st century. It's a total disconnect. <laughs> right. So, you know, uh, right now, we, the universities are having to conform and transform themselves, uh, literally, you know, uh, and to bring education, making it real and making it online. And uh, students are not willing to pay the kind of money that they paid before for a piece of paper which they find no value in. Mm -hmm. So, in essence, uh, the whole of education has to reform itself. And, uh, and uh, as, because we have a university here in Malaysia, West International, and we are dealing with this, we're changing it, making it online. Uh, we're one of the first and fastest to do so in responding to the um, student demands and requirements. Uh, exams are being conducted online. That, to me, is amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and they have actually pulled it off. They're doing it right now. So uh, these are the changes that are happening uh, just as we speak and mm. just within a matter of two months, literally. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, whoosh. It's just been a, a, a big smack to our face as global citizens of the world. <laughs> yeah, that is sweet. Yeah. Uh, interestingly but, enough, uh, recently you made a comment, a commentary, right? Uh, stating that fear is the most dangerous virus and we must stop its spread. Uh, tell us more about this. The biggest problem is our fear of anything new. We have got used to being in a rut. Mm. You know, we have got used to certain habits and practices, and snapping out of it is challenging to us. And, um, you know, we have seen the fear that led, you know, to COVID with panic buying and stockpiling of food, uh, again, driven by fear. Uh, the the in fear is in the in the digital age it can be transmitted instantly. It goes over the airways from the smartphone to smartphone at the speed of light, you know, it through social media feeds. It it multiplies so fast. So it has a tendency to overtake the facts. Uh, and uh, it's fully capable of taking us on, you know, flights of nightmarish fancy. Mm. And therein lies the, the challenge because uh, you know, when fear overtakes us, you know, uh, rationality goes out the window mm -hmm. and we are trapped, you know, in a euphoria of fear. We simply react without thinking. So this, again, you know, is a problem. COVID-19 has been blown totally out of proportion. There's this uh, paralyzed, uh, we, we, it has paralyzed us in a sense. But in, in reality, the fatality rate of this particular pandemic is, is a lot let less than any other preceding you know epidemic that we have had mm -hmm. it SARS and MERS and uh, you know the Nipah virus and all of that were a lot worse with the Zika virus and um, and certainly the Spanish flu which wiped out 50 million people in a matter of two years uh, 100 years ago is dramatically worse you know we we finally crossed a million people uh, you know recently and uh, mainly because I think 
uh, perhaps one or two countries who are very lax in their approach to this. But having said that, the fatality rate is still something that uh, we need to come to terms with. It's actually, you know, um, very, very much less than anything else we have faced and survived. So the fear is actually what is going to be crashing. The right now, the economy crashes uh, that we are facing across the world um, is based on fear. Mm-hmm. Fear buying, fear selling. Uh, markets are paralyzed by fear, and and that has to abate somewhat. Mm-hmm. That rationality has to come back in before we can move ahead. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you know, fear will not stop the virus. Only facts can do that. Mm-hmm. So uh, we, have, we have survived worse, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, we survive it by being, you know, calmer, not by losing ourselves into a fear-induced frenzy of some kind. Mm-hmm. A great, that's, uh, yeah, my belief. Yes, that's a that's a great reminder for all of us, especially you know we see you know fear uh, peaking and manifesting itself in so many different ways across the world, uh, particularly this past uh, week or so, yeah. Uh, with the uh, rioting and uh, the the racial based issues, yeah, uh, that yeah. are originating in the U.S. but it's affecting uh, us globally, particularly. Once again, the fact that we're in a such a open social media age at the moment, yeah. Well, you know, the U.S. the Western countries um, are actually faring a lot worse than the Asian countries uh, right now. Uh, Part of that is to do with um, the sense of discipline. We are a lot more disciplined in following and accepting, um, you know, instructions as it were. Uh, the West, where I know I have spent a lot of time living and working there, uh, is not is not tuned that way. They are, they are, that their mindset is to challenge authority. Mm-hmm. Therein lies uh, part of the challenges they're facing right now. Mm-hmm. And uh, but this uh, rioting is going on right now. It's not just in terms of you know one policeman and one incident in, in one city. It's also a, a general reaction uh, to the government of the day and to COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fear that has paralyzed the entire nation. Mm-hmm. You cannot. You cannot uh, lock down a country of the size of um, the U.S., uh, for that matter, or India, uh, which is also going through the same thing uh, for any length of time uh, without having this repercussion. So they have to deal with it um, regionally. Mm -hmm. They have to break it down and deal with it separately. You cannot have a one cure, one answer for the whole syndrome, you know? Right. Right. Yeah, interesting thoughts, Dato Sri. Thank you so much for sharing. Fast running out of time. Yeah, this conversation can go on for quite some time if we allow it to. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I appreciate and uh, you know your thoughts as well as your wisdom. And I think that that is um, something that's precious uh, that came out of today's uh, discussion and interview so far, Dato Sri. Appreciate it lots. Uh, mm-hmm. Any final thoughts you'd like to wrap up with? Well, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all our frontliners who are combating COVID-19 at the hospitals all over the world. Uh, I'd like to pay tribute to the countless acts of selflessness and kindness and courage that I've seen from them. Um, It is amazing and it it, it really makes me proud. Mm -hmm. Uh, And to all our Muslim friends and listeners, uh, I'd like to wish you all Slamat Hari Raya, Aydin Fitri, Mahav Zahir Batin, and to the rest of the Muslim population around the planet, Eid Mubarak. And thank you, Kong Yu. Yeah, welcome. It was a pleasure talking to you, Dr. Sri. You take care. Yes, have a pleasant day now. You too. Yes, thank you so much. Stay safe. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that was our guest of the day, Dr. Sri Vijay S. Warren, Executive Chairman of the QI Group. Uh, and I uh, hope you found that episode of this episode of Face to Face Enlightening. Thank you so much for listening in. And uh, for now, it's a wrap to the morning session of Momentum. And uh, up after the noon news updates, uh, we'll have a couple more hours of the show to go. My name is Kong Yu. Stay tuned. Good morning.